We've created this social view of marriage and love going together. Love and marriage fits together like a horse and carriage, or maybe not, as in the case of married with children, which is a great commentary on married life. In our own culture, though, we think of marriage without love as shameful. And as I said in the slide earlier, that prior to 100 years ago, strong romantic attachments were seen as something that were rather laughable, if not even a tragic aberration. In our view of marriage, sex takes place as well. For the average couple, most married couples have sex at least once a week. But the amount and how often a couple has sex has nothing to do with whether relationships will last. Researchers have found that couples that have sex infrequently are just as likely to have long-lasting relationships as those that have sex more often. So then you might wonder what kind of sex life leads to the greatest happiness. Researchers found that it's not how often couples have sex, but rather who is initiating it or refusing it, and that when both couples have some parity on initiating or refusing it, that is when couples report the greatest happiness. In general, though, men do tend to initiate sex more often than women. Women, on the other hand, tend to link love and sex more so than men. Which now leads us to a short discussion about extramarital affairs. Less than a third of all couples have extramarital affairs. So it's not even a third of all people that are married that are having them either, because sometimes one partner has an affair and the other does not. So it's the minority of individuals that have affairs. We know, though, that it's the husband more often that strays, but when they do, they don't link their infidelity to any kind of dissatisfaction of the partner or the relationship. Women, if they stray, they'll do it more often from curiosity. But women more often than men, they will allow it to become a full-fledged affair if she sees her paramour more often than once. And the reported rates of satisfaction and love between heterosexual couples and gay and lesbian couples is the same too. What we find though, as far as differences between gay and lesbian couples, is that the way in which they do household work is different. Gay and lesbian couples, as opposed to heterosexual couples, are more likely to split up the household work so that each partner has an equal amount of work to do. And an interesting difference between gay couples as opposed to lesbian couples is that lesbian couples are more likely to share the tasks and do them together, while gay couples are more likely to have one partner or the other do the task by themselves. So now DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, has been struck down, and the status regarding same-sex marriage is that states cannot ban it. And that's from the Obergefell versus Hodges case in 2013 that was heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. About 60% of the public is supporting same-sex marriage now. And we also know that in the Netherlands, two years after legalizing same-sex marriage, nearly 8% of marriages were between same-sex couples. Sociologists are often very interested, too, in what's known as universal taboos. This is referring to something that is consistent across many, if not all, cultures. It's hard to get concrete estimates on an issue such as incest because it's such a sensitive topic and very often difficult to assess and additionally may have different definitions. The estimates here do have a very broad range, anywhere from 3 to 35%. But we also know that there do seem to be certain patterns that exist. Oftentimes, it's a male authority figure that's the abuser, and they tend to be tyrannical, use physical force, or intimidation to control the victims. Often, the mother is very passive or has a poor self-image, and she's overly dependent. Let's turn now to thinking about the different sociological paradigms and what they might consider. The functionalist perspective 
might think in terms of how the family needs to fulfill critical functions necessary to society, those things such as reproduction, socialization, the care and protection and emotional support of all the individuals in the family, the assignment of status, and of course, regulation of sexual behavior. On the other hand, we could still use conflict, even though we're studying social institutions, and that does lend itself well to the structural functionalist perspective. But the conflict perspective, it would be likely to consider how different social arrangements benefit some people more than others. It might see women as being treated as sexual property or booty in war, and the fact that men tend to be the sexual aggressors in many instances, or how women are used for economic bargaining, such as arranged marriages, and how women are treated as property of their husbands in some cultures. So along the lines of the conflict perspective, we might think in terms of how some of the typical Western traditions that used to be part of American culture and still persist in some societies, and that these ideas benefit some individuals more than others. Those ideas, such as marriage, is not legal until it's consummated, and that actually is still the law in some regards, but it's somewhat complex in how it's enforced. That sexual assault in marriage is not legally rape. And again, that's technically not the law in the U.S., but often these cases won't be prosecuted. And that the principal grounds for divorce and marriage used to be infidelity, which actually changed in the 1970s when the idea of irreconcilable differences became the grounds for divorce and which sparked what's now known as the divorce revolution. And for the interactionist perspective, that might look at the interpersonal actions between partners, like the rituals that bond couples together and how traditions between couples create meaning and deepens the relationship. These different kinds of shared meanings convey ideas and values that couples agree are important to them.